Thank you, Dr. Finch. I don't want to come back. Really, Dr. Finch. I just have one announcement to make. If, if uh, Roy Finch, that's how the Finch came in, and Alice Howell are here, I, I would like to see them immediately after my talk, or else I might not be able to. I think that's better, yes. How is that acoustically, all right? Fine. Well, I've noticed uh, that among all this rich program that we, we have, and I'm enjoying it as much as you, that uh, there was a small subgroup which perhaps formed a connected nucleus of thought. And I'd like you to consider this talk as a continuation of the sessions in order of delivery, by, uh, first by our host, Peter Delight Khan, and then by, uh, in order of delivery, Dr. Prebrin, uh, rather Watson, uh, Prebrin, and Dr. Wigner. And uh, my, my session will more or less uh, coalesce with these with uh, perhaps a touch of Hasidism too. I, I have always felt that that was the soul of Judaism as every mystical part of every religion is its soul. The theology is simply the intellectual overlay. The experiential part of every religion is the heart of it. And that's very scientific. No scientist accepts anything unless it is experimental. And experimental as the, uh, any of you know French, it's the same as experiential, actually. So there's not so much a gap between science and spirit as there may seem. It was interesting uh, to me to, to, uh, to notice the, the, the um, mantra with which the uh, first speaker this morning ended. And uh, there is, of course, a direct correlation between the old elements of fire, air, earth, and water. I do fire, I feel water, I know air, and uh, when I say I am earth, there was a quintessence, though, also. And that could not be verbalized, because anything you would say about yourself wouldn't be true, because of it's being said because you are always more than you can possibly say about yourself. And that potential, that open-endedness, is really the, the grace that is the, is the crowning glory of our future. As uh, Dr. Wigner said, he wouldn't want to see us have a complete science. That's the same idea. That would be dead. And uh, so on that thought, I open. And we'll keep the ends open, too. Our, our host, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank him for his gracious hospitality to all the speakers and providing these really very comfortable surroundings for all of us. He, he said, in, in meditation, uh, there is a, <coughs> well I'll come to that later, uh, about the shift to the, to the uh, frequency, but he mentioned the purposeful aspect in the phenomena of life, this inner drive of matter to perfect itself. Uh, some years ago, I wrote an editorial, I think it was, well, it wasn't too long ago, it was 1974, I suppose, in which I uh, uh, asked about the limits of consciousness, and actually I couldn't find any. Once you separate the world into two parts, the dead and the living, then you spend your whole lifetime writing learned treatises as to how they are connected. And you've separated it in the first place. Actually, we don't know. Uh, so why not go the other way, the simpler way, and assume that consciousness is coextensive in different modes, in different relations, yes, in different qualities but that there is no such thing as matter completely devoid of consciousness or consciousness completely devoid of some expressive vehicle for manifestation. Once we assume that, we don't have to write any more than two 
prejudices as to how they are connected. Because they were always that way. In fact, if we look at it deeply enough, you can't have one without the other. This uh, theme of science and spirit is, is a very, very old one. We have body and soul, matter and mind, prakriti and purusha, shakti and shakta. Now the old tantra never made the error of assuming that shakti and shakta were separated. In fact, there is one absolute thing one can say. And there are very few absolute statements that one can make. Very, very few. Otherwise one runs the risk of dogmatism, uh, sheer error, narrowness, bigotry. But there is one absolute statement one can make. And that is that there are no absolute separations. Notice I use the word absolute there, the second absolute, advisedly. There are relative separations, but no absolute separations. That's one of the few absolutes. I, I was also reminded, speaking of this fifth quintessence that I mentioned about not being able to verbalize oneself, there, there is a, a very interesting novel, I think it was originally written in, in Yiddish, called The Dibuk by Marink. And uh, I remember a, 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 a part there, it was very Hasidic, and uh, I saw it many, many years ago, but I've never forgotten this scene. Uh, this one man is in the, is in the throes of, of trying to uh, get out of his self-centeredness uh, through love. The theme is the Shir Hashirim, or the Song of Songs. And uh, the, the wise man says to him, Zayn's gloss, look in the mirror. Basisto, what do you see? He said, I see myself. And then the wise man said, if that's all you see, you don't see anything. You have to see more than yourself when you look out. Now, we can look at the objective world as not an inanimate thing opposing us, but as the eyes of all other creatures looking back at us, who consider us also the objective world. So there is no such thing as a sharp dichotomy here. There is a oneness. We, we have this marvelous molecule, the DNA, which certainly acts as though it had a kind of sentience. I brought up the point at, at, a, um, at a meeting in Locarno some years ago. We were, um, uh, Ross Ashby was still alive, Warren McCulloch was alive yet. They all seemed to go very fast uh, in the 1960s. And uh, we were talking about fundamental particles. And uh, I said, gentlemen, if there were a Martian anthropologist over New York observing, and maybe he was a physicist too, he had some statistical training, he would see these little uh, uh, holes, subways of course, and, and he would see hordes of beings rushing into them and out of them at certain times. And he would be able to compute statistical laws of flow for these things, which would have a probability of being correct. And uh, he would derive a probabilistic uh, uh, physics for these motions of these particles. But he couldn't predict what one would do if someone forgot his wallet or if uh, he had a fight with his wife or mistress, he would have to go back uh, to the house perhaps to patch it up. And you couldn't predict what this one individual would do. Neither can we predict what, a fund what one single particle will do. So I propose the fact, how can we say that they are not alive? Perhaps each is doing its thing, but statistically, indistinguishable. For instance, moths. If you, if you want to get a moth out of the house, as I've done many times, I am very genius about moths and insects. I, I let them out. And I go to great trouble to free them because I don't like to see them getting burned or starved. So I carried this moth. I learned by, I should have been more intelligent, but I had the light on in the hall. Of course, the moth went back to the light. So I uh, had to put the light on outside, put out the lights in the hall, and then the moth went absolutely predictably out toward the light. So moths will go toward light, and you can rely on it, but they are not mechanical. That doesn't mean they're mechanical. They, evidently, that light means a lot to them. They are willing to die for it. That's a very interesting symbol. They are actually willing to die. Just as some uh, uh, monkeys will rather uh, manipulate the pleasure centers of the brain than eat. 
the whole concept of love and even sexual love in physical relations is completely wrong. Sex is the most psychological thing there is. It's very psychosomatic, as women know more than men. If the psychology is not right, nothing is right. Nothing is right. It's a very delicate thing. It's absolutely not physical. Physical relations are falling down and hurting your knee. Bumping into a door. Right, well, I'm getting off the subject, perhaps. Pascal said that, uh, well, it's in, in French, it's very beautiful. I'd like to say it in French. French. Le cœur a ses raisons que la raison ne comprend pas. The heart has its reasons which reason doesn't understand. And then I would say also, la conscience a ses forces que la science ne comprend pas. In other words, consciousness has its forces that science doesn't know yet. Now, it's nice in French because we have conscience for consciousness and science for science. So we make a kind of a pun. And uh, <coughs> this is true. Science is beginning to be aware of this. And uh, I think that uh, Dr. Eugene Wigner here is one of the primary pioneers who had the great intellectual courage to step out and say these things at a time when it was even uh, difficult to say them. Uh, it would have been perhaps damaging if his, if his professional status had not been as high as it was. But now it's being eminently justified every day. Science and psychology, uh, physics and psychology rather, are coming full circle. And we are, we are seeing some very interesting things happening. So we will take a little uh, look at some of these phenomena. Pascal also said, and this time I will only give you the English, man is, and I will quote because I want you to know that it's the actual words, man is to himself the most wonderful object in nature. He meant to be a man, the generic man. I don't want to get into any error conflicts here. In German, man with one N is impersonal, sexless. It means one. And the English man, like sportsmanship, did not mean male. It goes right to the German man, which was completely sexless. So, when we have the generic man, we don't mean male in English. And I'd like to restore the English language to that extent, that there are two uses. And this is the generic man, as in German, man spricht, man sagt. One knows, one says. Man is to himself the most wonderful object of nature, for he cannot conceive what the body is, still less what the mind is. This is still true today. And least of all, how a body should be united to a mind. This is the consummation of his difficulties, and yet it is his very being. So, man know thyself is still the great challenge. Now, to get back to a previous, uh, uh, a previous theme that we heard from uh, Dr. Lyle Watson. And I would like to say, on my part, uh, bio autobiographically now, that there is a grasshopper and a cockroach in my life I shall never forget. Uh, and a cicada, but that's a story for a bit later. This uh, grasshopper, uh, one among many, uh, but uh, very unusual, allowed me to stroke it, and in fact enjoyed being stroked on the back, like a cat. Many of you perhaps have had similar experiences. The cockroaches are much harder to find because they have an inbuilt uh, uh, instinct for running away from danger. And you have to approach a cockroach in high. It's a good test of your meditation. If you can get a cockroach to stop and allow you to stroke its antenna, you are in a state of almost samadhi. It can be done. It can be done. You just have to, have to love it enough. And by the way, all these distinctions of philia and agape and so on, they're very, they're very good. The, actually what they refer to is the appropriateness, not any difference in the love. Love is love. There is one love. But there are different appropriate expressions for it in different situations. And it's that appropriateness, that etiquette of love, that distinguishes these kinds. But there's only one. Only one basic love. Uh, now, I shall begin with the, with the mésange. That, that's, uh, I met in Lausanne, so I used the French word it's, it's, uh, when I lived there. It's a, a titmouse, it's a bird related to the swift. And uh, we had uh, a lovely, uh, lived in a very lovely old house with, with a balcony there on the second floor. And we had a very large bedroom. And there were these windows that opened this way on the balcony. 
and there were several awnings and, and, and things there that you could suspend uh, little bags of seeds for instance which I did I suspended a little net bag of seeds and I had uh, I had a, a good time uh, while I was having breakfast in bed and working watching the uh, birds but the sparrows were too aggressive and they were driving away the maison, just as weeds drive away flowering plants and beautiful plants, the lower, uh, more, more, uh, less mannerly animals drive away the more sensitive. So I had to devise something, and it was quite cold then in Lausanne, so I put a long cord on the little net bag just to the top of its cord and put the cord through the keyhole and brought it to my bed so that I could jerk the bag every time a sparrow came on it. <laughs> And the sparrows didn't know what was happening because I never did it for the titmice. <laughs> so finally they got the idea that they, they shouldn't go there. Now, the, the point I'm making is that the titmice normally would, would go on the net bag with their little um, claws and then peck the seeds out through the netting. But there was one who didn't do that. It was a male, I'm sorry, but uh, probably they're more exploratory. <laughs> And he got on the top of the bar and uh, he held one claw on the bar and put the other one down, grabbed the string and put it up here, then put the other claw on top of that. Then he did that again and again and again until he got the bag on top. And then he ate the seeds at leisure without having to hang on it in undignified fashion as all the rest were doing. Now that was an example of individual intelligence, creative intelligence. And uh, I, I really, really enjoyed that. There was individual intelligence. There was individual reaction in the cockroaches and the, and the grasshoppers too. Some are so that no matter what your state of samadhi, you cannot equal their state of fear. And it won't work. Uh, so there is individuality all the way down, it seems. And we of course know this from the autoimmune system. Our proteins are individual too. You see, with all the collectivism we are hearing today, we are hearing too little about the creative individualization of the universe. There's no contradiction. In fact, the only really co uh, true collectivism worthy of, of any admiration or respect is the collective formed by individuals who could, if they had to, stand alone. Who are creative individuals. Otherwise, you have an anti. And that is one of the problems uh, uh, facing us. But this individuality goes all the way through. So one has to beware of collectivism without the other side, because otherwise it, 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 the bottom line is, you be a collective and I lead you. And uh, we don't need that. We had too much of that throughout history, and it didn't work, it never worked. Because the, the ones who led were developing themselves as individuals, and nobody else was. And now we all demand development. I, I recently lectured at Trieste to a very interesting uh, audience uh, of advanced students from developing countries, from Mauritius, from, from India, from Sudan, from uh, uh, South American countries. And uh, I remember there was a, um, a, I was talking about the developing countries in one part, it was on systems theory, and there was a Yugoslavian chap who, who said uh, in the question period, well, I am from a developed country, so this doesn't apply. And uh, well, I said, well, that's true. I said, uh, in a way, I said, India does have more steel mills than Yugoslavia, which happens to be a fact. But India has other problems. So, and then I pointed out, and they seem to be actually glad and relieved that the words developing and developed country is actually a misnomer. The United States is a developing country in its deserts. It hasn't done a thing about them, which is one of our great shames. We had enough money to desalinate and, and, and make water pipelines and make our deserts blossom and there would be no food shortage at all. But we didn't do that. I hope we still will. And uh, India is undeveloped in other ways, but she has more steam mills than Yugoslavia. So we have to say in what the country is developed and in what they're developing. In fact, when I was in the Sudan, I had an interview with the Minister of the Interior and I said, gentlemen, I don't consider Sudan a developing country, I consider it a still clean country. Your air is still clean, your water is still clean, your earth is still clean. So your problem would be non-pollutive industrialization. They wanted to industrialize at any cost. Unfortunately, they decided on pollutive industrialization. Why? It cost less and it was 
a money problem. You see, here are the practical problems of the world as they face the ideal. And it's extremely hard to get an ideal manifested. You run into all these other things. Well, now uh, I want to get back to the animal world and uh, point out another thing. I found that moths uh, sleep. Uh, I found a moth uh, in, just before dawn and uh, I, I touched it very, very gently. And normally when you touch this species of moth, it flies away immediately, the slightest touch. This way it, it shivered its wings just like that, as if it was stirring, it was stirring obviously in sleep, as I realized. And then in a few seconds it became completely afraid and flew away when it woke up. But it was asleep. It was very interesting to me. They had no eyelids, but they sleep. It was completely withdrawn. So that's a change of consciousness. So I proved, at least to my own satisfaction, that insects undergo changes of consciousness. We know certainly that they are also ag have aggressive, they have anger. And the praying mantis will demonstrate this very easily. And they have uh, uh, other moods, even insects, it's incredible. Well, uh, now about the orchid. We go down to the plant level now. There's an orchid that could just as well have survived uh, Darwinianly in many other ways, but it chose to imitate the, a, f a certain female fly's sexually provocative features. So that the male fly would think this was a female, try to mate with the orchid and then pollinate it. And that's all the orchid wanted. It was a booby trap for the male fly. Now that's extremely interesting. That shows almost a uh, creative insight. We can't explain this by Darwinian, ordinary Darwinian theory. It's impossible. In fact, we're being driven to the point where the, uh, the old line Darwinian theory is retreating uh, in under, under uh, so many facts that seem to show that there is, on repeated experience, a change in the DNA through the brain which can then be transmitted to the offspring even though the adult experiencing this change doesn't benefit from it. In other words, tailor-made evolution. Well, I won't go into that anymore, but uh, I wanted to, wanted to point that out. Now, now I'm coming to the cicada. Uh, it's strange to talk so much biology when I was introduced as a mathematician, but you know, the word mathematics um, has a terrible effect on most people. And it's almost the kiss of death to be introduced uh, as a mathematician. So rather than, uh, rather than take up the time with simply technical matters, I'm giving you the results of certain things which I have also, uh, I hope, found higher kinds of number that, that model. I'll just give you one example of what I mean by that. There's, a, there's kinds of number that we call non-associative. That is, if you have A, B, and C, and you group B and C together and multiply them together first, and then multiply A by that product, you get a different end result than if you first group A and B together and multiply it by C, even though you don't change the order. Now, that may seem very esoteric and very surprising, but actually, socially, that is quite common. If two people talk together first before they talk to the third, it can be a very different result, as every politician knows, when the other two are talking first. So a, a non-associative uh, uh, multiplication is very political, and uh, it's suggestive of social matters, and then also non-commutative multiplication, if one takes the precedence over the other. For instance, we are taught two times three is the same as three times two. It is in the outcome, but imagine a river where uh, there were uh, two boats, and say six people, waiting to get over in two boats, and there was a forest fire coming their way. And uh, I'll imagine the same six people in, with three boats. Well, you get six to the other side, all right. Three times two is two times three. But in the case of the three boats, some might live. So in this case, uh, it's, it's quite different. Three times two and, and two times three can be the difference between life and death. See, the times, uh, the French has the same thing. Trois fois. Uh, the three times, it means three times two, means two taken three times. The time, the three is the operator, and the two is the operator. And when you say two times three, you're taking three twice. And that can be very, very different in actual experience. Six times one is you take them all over in one trip. 
and that may be the best solution of all. But I'm just pointing this out to show you that ordinary arithmetic uh, doesn't uh, really contradict these higher arithmetics. It just doesn't say all we need to know in certain cases. But it's very useful because in most cases for ordinary life, we don't care to know how the result was brought about. We just want the end result. And then ordinary arithmetic is fine. Now, when, uh, to get back to uh, the, the cicada, when in Corpus Christi I was waiting to go to uh, Machu Picchu, my, and I was waiting very long for this chap to get packed, my uh, bored eye caught an extraneous small object in the swimming pool nearby. And when I went up to, to look at it, it was a cicada. And I picked it up, it was completely drowned. Then I, I manipulated the limbs and I noticed that rigor mortis hadn't set in. So being bored and having nothing better to do and having found this, I had never found a cicada in a swimming pool. So I was interested and I thought, wonder could I revive it by artificial respiration? <laughs> if it isn't too far gone. Now insects don't breathe through their mouths. They breathe through their abdomens in a series of small holes on both sides called spiracles. So their thorax is very hard. So I held it by the thorax upside down where I could see the spiracles and I pushed the abdomen in and then let it go as if you do this. I couldn't do mouth to mouth resuscitation on this way because there are six spiracles and they're very small and you'd only get one at a time anyway. So I did that for about three minutes and the thing started to move to my great delight. And then finally it flew away. It was a very moving experience, but I, I, I thought then my mind raced on because this wasn't all there was to that. That was the love side fine, but there was, a, there was an intellectual side here, a very disturbing question. Uh, this cicada had been rescued by a life form as far above it as perhaps a higher being would be to us. Almost a godlike creature walking around. We're not that lucky. Man is the only one who can look only one way. The dog can look down at a clam and say, what a stupid thing. And then look up and say, my goodness, you know, my master. We can't do that on earth. Man is in a very strange position. So he has to go for to dimensions beyond where we are now to find his superior or superiors. It's obviously completely short-sighted to say we are the most advanced form of life. We're the most advanced form physically incarnated on earth. So I thought, well, this cicada was rescued by a higher life form. That's a strange destiny. How many cicadas have that destiny? Very, very few. <laughs> Extremely few. Perhaps this was the first time anybody thought of doing such a crazy thing. So, or, or even found a cicada in that position. Now, then I thought further, well, this cicada has individual destiny. Well, then I remembered every sparrow falls, is seen, and so on. And I had a very interesting proof of individual destiny right down to the insect level. You see, one counterexample overthrows a universal negative. All right. So uh, that, that was the, uh, the cicada. Now... In physics. <laughs> there was a trap in all this. Uh, uh, Schrodinger derived his, uh, uh, his equation in a way that other people uh, have not derived it. They derive it a different way now. And he originally derived it rather lo long roundabout way from Hamiltonian theory. And in his original derivation, there is a term which he himself suggested neglecting. And uh, he said because the usual reason, and Whitaker gives this in his history of of the ether as the reason Whitaker, the famous analyst, says it was small in relation to the other terms. But the argument doesn't hold because it was multiplied by I. And uh, uh, the, the, uh, one cannot simply neglect it because it was, it was kind of a phase term. Anyway, uh, even if one uh, doesn't adopt that argument, the, the Schrodinger wave equation implies that probability waves, as all other waves, have phase. And these phases can interfere or reinforce. So we get the beginnings of a science of destiny where two probabilities could interfere with each other.
or reinforce each other. The beginnings of a science of destiny. Of the situation. Now, it's interesting, this whole concept of potential energy, we, it's, it's quite mysterious even in, in physics. If we enlarged it, for instance, if I took a ball and put it up here, its potential energy is changed. And of course, the probabilities of what can happen are changed too. So potential energy is really quite interesting and one can show that changes in potential energy would lead to changes in probability wave phase. And therefore changes in possible destiny if we enlarge this. Now, if we can somehow include in potential energy other types of energy, like the energy that might come from a completely new outlook. We know this for a fact that if a, a man or woman has a completely new outlook, a religious conversion or some kind of conversion experience, the, their power to do, their whole destiny is changed. And uh, this, to me, it's just the beginning, but it opens the door perhaps to a, a larger science if we can get some specific way to define these changes in potential energy, which in turn could change probabilities. I'll just mention that in passing, but uh, it, it, uh, it, is, it is relevant to what we are talking about. Schopenhauer, a long time ago, he said that uh, the Kantian Ding an sich, the thing in itself, was the will in everything, the consciousness. And that, that's an excellent definition because the, the other, the, the straight Kantian schools just got bogged down in intellectualism and never could define the thing in itself. And uh, the reason I mentioned Schopenhauer's optimism, uh, as uh, Dr. Long said, uh, since he said that I ought to explain what I meant, uh, Schopenhauer said that this world was indeed a very unsatisfying place for the selfish will. And it was only when it was liberated into what he called Nirvana, that uh, it became then ultimately and very satisfying. So that's a kind of a realistic optimism because it is unsatisfying. Uh, many people's lives, uh, if they're constantly pursuing just what they want, just their own tiny thing, irrespective of anybody else's wants, they're going to end up unhappy. They've got to. And I've seen it again and again. So this is really optimism. Now, there, there is we are talking about this, this great us, including all other life forms, as well as our own. I think one speaker mentioned this. I, I remember a poem, uh, the you that is in me, the I that is in you, this we is God in us. Now, perhaps I will, um, how am I doing on time? Ten. Good. I was going to say perhaps I'll make precedent by ending early and just stopping. <laughs> I, I want to mention two, two other uh, uh, things. I could, well, I, I think rather than mention mathematical uh, examples, there is one mathematical example though that's interesting. When you put coins around a central coin, uh, of all the same kind of coin, of course, like all pennies, all dimes, all quarters. How many can fit around one? Any, any answers? Six, yes. And with ping pong balls, how many could fit around one? Who said? Twelve, right. How about in four dimensions, anybody? Four dimensional spheres? Well, twenty-four can go around one. You have more room. In five dimensions, forty can go around one. In six, seventy-two, you're getting room because you're going in new directions all the time. That one is still there, but there are different ways. Just as you put the six around one and two, then you have two ways and three, right? So you can put three here and three here. So you have another two ways and four, another two ways and five. That's why it keeps going. So now in six there are 72, in, in seven there is 126 that fit around one, and in eight, 240. Now in 1963 I found a formula, I was very delighted, I couldn't prove it till much longer. It came to me uh, rather fast while I was watching the titmice uh, and, and pulling these strings and I wrote to Donald Coxeter about it. I was so delighted and I said, Donald, I found a, a, a simple formula that will give the numbers of the spheres that go from one to eight dimensions. 
And uh, then uh, he, he played me a, a trick and published it without telling me and, and, and of course gave me credit. And I was very happy about that. Uh, but I didn't know he would do that, but I was just excited about it. And the reason I stopped at eight is a very interesting thing. I wish I could have gone beyond, but something happens at eight dimensions. Uh, uh, this is not a mechanical process. Nature is not mechanical, not even mathematical reality. After eight dimensions, the whole symmetry of space changes. And we cannot use the same reasoning, the same lattices, nothing. It becomes much more complicated. For instance, in nine, only 272 go around one. That's only 32 more than eight. 16 on one side and 16 on the other side of the ninth dimension. But eight to 40, and that's a tremendous jump from 126 and seven, right? It almost doubles it. So at this eight, something remarkable happens. We also get a lattice in eight dimensions, which you can compose into uh, 127 uh, eight-dimensional tetrahedra and nine eight-dimensional octahedra, making 137, which is interestingly enough the uh, reciprocal of the fine structure constant. Uh, actually, the fine structure constant has a little decimal, and that may represent a contribution from other dimensions, and our universe may be basically an eight-dimensional lattice. Uh, anyway, uh, I, that's just an example to show you that mathematics is not mechanical. Now, we are at an evolutionary crossroads. We can choose the antheap, we can self-destruct, or we can have creative individualization of society. We are all hoping for the third. It will never be the antique. I thought for a while it would and I became very sad, but human beings are too ornery and cussed. It would be self-destruct or it would be creative individualization. And they might go hand in hand. There might be little bands that are destroying and, and, and others that are developing. But it would never be a successful antique. Now, uh, I would like to end on a, a Mongolian uh, proverb Mongolian, interestingly enough, is a language related to uh, Hungarian and uh, Finnish. And I, I just know this one uh, Mongolian proverb. That's the extent of my Mongolian. Tegun shilen kushinar tur adzu setkil ige samadhi. Samadhi, of course, is a uh, Sanskrit word. Now, this means, it means a lot more than the Mongolian is very compressed. It means the serenity that persists in you without any intellectual activity throughout even the daily changes of life. That is the true meditation. <laughs> that English explanation. The serenity that persists in you without any intellectual activity necessary and throughout all daily changes of consciousness and daily life. That indeed is the true meditation. That is known as the meditation without seed. It makes no karma. And when one has that, well, one is that then. So I reject the cogito ergo sum. Whether you stress the cogito or the o, the ego at the end, or the cogito, and I would propose amor ego sum. Because Unless we love, we are nothing. I'd like to end with a, uh, with a, uh, may I, uh, do I have two minutes? With 14 lines from Shakespeare, my favorite sonnet, 146, it's not as well known as it should be. Poor soul, the center of my sinful earth, pressed by these rebel powers that be array, why dost thou pine within and suffer dearth, painting thine outward walls? so costly gay. Why so large cost, having so short a lease? Dost thou upon thy fading mansion spend? Shall worms, inheritors of this excess, eat up thy charge? Is this thy body's end? Then soul, live thou upon thy servant's loss, and let that pine to aggravate thy store, by terms divine, in selling hours of dross. Within be fed, without be rich no more. So shalt thou feed on death, that feeds on men. And death once dead, there's no more dying then.